Greetings and welcome to our latest episode of Si Yo Fuera Una Canción, If I Were a Song. We are a community-based podcast and radio show in which people of Santa Ana, California, tell us in their own words about the music that means the most to them. I am Elizabeth Le Guin, your program host and director of this project. I've been a musician since I was 10 years old, which makes over half a century now. I was trained as a classical cellist, and I'm currently a professor of musicology at UCLA. I live in Santa Ana, where I'm part of a community that practices Mexican traditional music. This project is based on my conviction that we people in the modern world need to learn to listen to one another, and that music, and all it brings us, is the perfect place to begin. My name is David Castaneda, music researcher here for the Si Yo Fuera Una Canción podcast. I'm a percussionist specializing in musics from Latin America and the United States. In addition to playing these musics, I have also studied them. I recently finished my PhD dissertation in ethnomusicology, which explored the ways that musicians are listening to each other across national, cultural, and ethnic lines. I'm so happy to be a part of this project, using my training and my performance experience to bring you the stories, music, and lived experiences of those living right here in Santa Ana. Welcome, Abel. I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself to our listeners with your full name and, if you like, your age and a bit about your life, how you came to be in Santa Ana, your profession, and things like that. So, yeah, whenever you're ready. Yes, thanks a lot, Elizabeth. It's, well, thank you so much for inviting me to share this space with you and your listeners. Uh, this is a very interesting project. My name is Abel Ruiz Garcia. I'm originally from a community in Zacatecas called La Chichila. La Tichila Zacatecas, Mexico. I'm 37 years old, I think. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've started losing track. But uh, yes, I'm 37, and I've been in Santa Ana, wow, well, since I was 12. Well, so the history of my family here in Santa Ana has been a lot of back and forth. In fact, I was born here in a house over on Hazard. That's what the street is called. My mother had me at home, I think because... Well, now it's become popular for lots of reasons, right? To give birth at home. Mm -hmm, yeah. But at that time, I think there was a program where it was more affordable to have a baby at home. And so my parents chose that option. And since then, well, like I said, we've been coming and going. I was born here. And when I was 11 months old, we left for Mexico. We came back here when I was six or seven for another two years. And I did first and second grade at Madison. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we went back to Mexico again. I did fourth, fifth, and sixth grade there. And then when we came back again, this time for good, to Santa Ana, and when I was 12, I started seventh grade at uh, Lathrop. And, well, I've been more or less established here ever since. So it's a little... Yeah. Yeah. How interesting. You've truly had an international childhood, right? Really, really quite a mix of the two countries. Yes. Well, most of my memories are from when I was in Mexico, you know, from those times. It was like a, a sort of strange lapse when I was here in first and second grade. For some reason, I don't remember much from that time. But when I was in Mexico, well, I remember a lot, even from back when I was in kindergarten. Hmm. And you always, always came back to Santa Ana, always here. Mm hmm Yeah. It's really interesting what you're saying about a home birth because, well, as you know, these things aren't really promoted here in the United States. There's a lot of resistance from the medical profession, right? The medical establishment. Uh, in fact, I had my daughter who, in, in fact, she's about your age. She's 36. I had her at home in the Bay Area up in Northern California. And I had to search for a doctor that would assist in a home birth. It was really a challenge because the medical association here in the States doesn't want it. Yes. Actually, my partner and I are having a baby, a beautiful baby girl, and we are anticipating the same thing, right? That you go to the hospital and you have no control of the situation. There's no humanity in the way the person giving birth is treated. Mm. That's, that's why we're going to have the birth at home. I think there's been a lot more learning lately about this because now there's like a network of people doing parteria or midwifery as they call it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they, 
they're interested in reviving these practices, right? So I think it's pretty cool to be able to go back and recover that. It's really important to humanize giving birth. Yeah. You know, it's that treating childbirth like a disease, that's insane, right? (laughs) <laughs> the, the most fundamental moment in life, to treat it like a disease, that truly makes no sense. So how cool, how awesome, and, and of course, congratulations. Mm, thank you. The medicalization of birth is a theme we need to think about here in the United States. The richest country in the world is number 60 in the world when it comes to the health and well-being and survival of mothers and babies. This unencouraging situation is a direct result of racism and sexism. A hundred years ago, the midwife was a broadly accepted figure across all U.S. American social classes. And the great majority of midwives were women of color. Many of them were African American. The medical establishment, made up largely at that time of white men, of course, took control of birth away from midwives, and our for-profit medical system did the rest, turning birth into a very profitable industry. This is not to say that medical advances aren't useful and important when it comes to birth. For premature babies, for example, for mothers with complications, medical science has been a godsend, of course. But for the 85% of births that are normal, the intervention of doctors and hospital surroundings simply aren't necessary. Okay, let's talk about your profession. What work are you doing here in Santana? So right now I'm working partly as a farmer. I'm part of an urban gardening cooperative called Grese, that is grow. It's an up-and-coming cooperative that's also an organization that promotes and advocates for members of our community that are, that are involved with or want to get involved with the field of food production, right? Mm. So in my case, well, I've been taking part in urban agriculture for five or six years now, and I've had the chance to associate with, well, really create an association with a couple of other people. Jaime, for example, grows vegetables, but he's also focused on mushroom cultivation. No kidding. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so we do it all together because if we were working separately, none of us would be able to sustain our projects. So we are coming together to support each other in creating a produce program, right? With organic boxes or baskets, like they say in Mexico, where people are already subscribing. We provide a variety of organic produce every week or every other week or once a month, whatever the person wants. But yes, it's a new project. Um, But that's basically the idea, to take control of our food system as a community, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Let's not even get into all the problems with the current food system. It's so damaging to the earth and to people working within the industry. So we're trying to change all that. Yes, and and here we are again talking about like the base. I mean, the most fundamental elements of life, right? Birth is one, and another is our food. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. How cool! And us urban folks, a lot of the time, we forget what good food is because there's there's so much fast food everywhere, right? But growing and caring for a vegetable garden growing plants, it it makes you conscious of what food really is and how it connects us to the land, right? Yes, totally. The ability to grow your own food or to have more spaces like our farm, it's a great resource, not only for the food, right? I also think of it in the most basic terms. Just being in a garden, it teaches you how to walk, no? (laughs) Because you have to watch where you step. There have been people volunteers who enter the garden and we tell them go grab a shovel or whatever and they walk right over the planting bed stepping on everything (laughs) And, and we're saying no you can't walk there you have to watch where you're walking okay and even the way you walk matters right i mean you're walking on your own food you know 
never thought about it that way, but yeah, it's true. Literally, the way we connect the land with our feet. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so there are many teachings. Simple act of being among the crops, no? Mm. And it's, and well, I'd like to share, well, since I'm going to be a father, I have the mentality that like, this is for the next generations. I mean, what spaces will they have to talk to each other in? Mm -hmm. What will they talk about? How will they see themselves? What will they want to build? And so I think we need more spaces like our farm so they have that foundation, right? To have that option of planting as part of the conversation within their existence in an urban environment, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's important that we work hard to be able to provide that resource. Yes, yes, super important. It's really beautiful work, really lovely, and I greatly respect it. As you know, I I have yeah. <laughs> a, a little garden behind my house. And, you know, I could find something to be done there every hour of every day. And it's a really small garden, but it demands quite a lot of attention and commitment. It, it demands a lot, but it also gives a lot. A whole lot. It's a way to connect ourselves to this planet. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, well then, let's let's get to your first song. The song you gave me that in some way represents where you come from. It represents your origins. All right, so here it is. Sobre las olas, or Over the Waves. Yo quiero amor por el La inmensidad de las olas flotando te vi y al irte a salvar por tu vida la vida perdí tu dulce visión en mi alma indeleble grabó <laughs> oh <laughs> there's a piece of old Mexico all right. Uh, tell us a little bit about how this song entered your life and why you chose it as the musical image of your origins. Ah, well, it was pretty tough, no? Because thinking of my origins, well, in general, I think of my my aunts, uncles, my mother, my parents' music in general, which is rancheras, right? Mm. Which are not so much regional because the genre can be quite diverse regionally. But rancheras are something my uncles always listen to and still listen to in Mexico. In particular, Pedro Infante, because of my mom and also my uncle Salvador, who is one of the oldest of his generation, they love Pedro Infante. <laughs> my uncle Salvador is always saying things like, this singer is the boss, right? <laughs> so there are people that do voice impersonations like comedians, uh-huh, yeah. And, and yeah, and in, in general, they can do many people. There's people that imitate Vicente Fernandez or even a couple that attempt uh, Jose Alfredo Jimenez, but they say no one has ever been able to imitate Pedro Infante. It's just the voice that he had. Ah, uh, yeah, for sure. And, and that's why Pedro Infante in particular, since I grew up with his music and my mom, when she do chores or wash the laundry outside, because we all still did laundry by hand. Well, okay, not really us, more like it was all my mom. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Well, well, that was the music she, she'd always be playing, right? She's, she's put it on at top volume, and, and well, I think Pedro Infante was one of the most, who was who we listened to the most. Mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to mention that of all his music, because Pedro Infante sang in many styles, my favorite are his waltzes. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. The waltzes, because I like that style best, especially this song. I'm not sure if you recognize it, but it's by Juventino Rosas, a Mexican composer. Yeah. It was really well known, but once the waltz became very famous, it was even being attributed to the Germans, who are known for their waltzes. But originally the music Yeah, was, yes, yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's Mexican music. In, in fact, I'll confess something to you. When I was doing my prep for this interview, I listened to the song several times, and I thought, oh, yeah, I recognize this melody. I mean, everyone recognizes it, right? And I thought, 
And this composer, Juventino Rosas, he stole it from the German composers. <laughs> because up to now, I thought this super famous melody was by some famous waltz composer like Johann Strauss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was wrong. I did my research and no, it's a really famous melody, but its roots are Mexican. So I am duly corrected. <laughs> and yeah, I, I didn't know until now that Juventino Rosas composed this melody. So Juventino Rosas, uh, poor guy, he only lived to be 26 years old. He was- 26, wow. I know, I know. And he was already an international sensation by the time he died. He, he was born in 1868 in Guanajuato. And he died on tour in Cuba. Oh, wow. <laughs> and the poor guy, he was, he was touring around as a violinist. I think he was mostly a violinist. Uh, constantly, because he was poor. He had a lot of trouble making ends meet, even though some of his published music uh, got so very famous. And it, and it did. It was very, very, very famous, this song. You know, this famous melody. I don't, I don't sing it as nicely as Pedro Infante does, <laughs> but, but it, it's, it is popular in so many different genres now. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has gotten such broad distribution, not just as, as a waltz, but New Orleans jazz, bluegrass, country and western, old time fiddling, Tejano music, you name it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's gone everywhere. And like you said, Pedro just made this song classic, you know, with his voice and everything. And as Abel talks about in, his, in the interview, this song means so much to Abel because Pedro means so much to so many people, not only as a musician and a Mexican, you know, he's become very much the symbol of Mexican culture. And uh, I think this song encapsulates a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, both both the song itself and then this performance, the one, the performance that Abel chose mm -hmm. are just, just iconic. They are, yeah. And it's, I mean, not to make uh, this particular discussion, a debate on it, but I, I do always like to bring up the fact that while people like Pedro Infante uh, became these, these symbols of national culture, Mexican national identity, and very much so mariachi music, who uh, he's very much associated with that music. These musics, uh, specifically mariachi, has its roots in indigenous communities in Mexico and the colonial era and all of those struggles, which sometimes aren't talked about all that much when Pedro Infante comes up. Uh, Abel <laughs> sees him as very much this icon and this point of pride, which he is, and that's great. That should be the most important thing always. Um, but I, I do like to always remind people, you know, that a lot of these musics that we love so much, they have their roots in indigenous communities that are sometimes aren't talked about all that much, and it's important to remember. That's right. We, we touched on that briefly in the interview I did with Graciela Olguin, mm -hmm. who also brought a lot of wonderful mariachi music to the table. And uh, yeah, I, I remember mentioning that in that interview. And, and just to close out this, this issue, of course, the waltz, or vals as it's called in, in Spanish, well, that was indigenous music too. It just happened to be um, German indigenous peasants. <laughs> who invented that dance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of interesting, this, this play of uh, really international play of, of styles and origins for the, for, for the music that becomes iconic to a nation. Mm -hmm. But okay, returning to your reasons for choosing this song, it sounds like it's just the voice alone of Pedro Infante that symbolizes or represents your childhood. Is that true? That that voice, I mean, much like you said, it's it's without equal, it's unique. And and the very sound of his singing reminds you of when you were a child. Am, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. In, in particular, that anecdote about when I was growing up. Well, I think it's one of the things I appreciate about my uncles and my mom. They fostered a sense of pride in us, you know, pride in being Mexican. And not only being Mexican, but also part of the community we come from. Mm. So I think that when we talk about music, it's like a support to that pride. My uncle Salvador was a musician. He played in the wind band. He would say, listen to that voice, how it changes tones. Well, the truth is, I don't know too much about music, but they wanted me to hear him 
to foster that pride in him. Mm -hmm. Listen to what a beautiful voice he has. I think in my subconscious, I had this pride where I'd say, wow, we have amazing composers and not only composers, but singers too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's one of those memories that I have that takes me back to that childhood in Mexico, learning those lessons, you know. What a lovely memory. And perhaps you can dance the waltz? <laughs> <laughs> uh, more or less. <laughs> At school, we had to do dance performances. Uh, if your listeners have heard about schools in Mexico, well, every year you have to do a dance performance for Mother's Day or graduation. And, well... Many of the dances we'd have to do were waltzes. Huh. Interesting, because according to my research, Rosa's waltz was composed in 1885, so way before your Uncle Salvador's time. So it's really a reflection of a very long-gone era, right? An old chapter in the history of Mexico and, and in the world, really. At that time... The waltz was in fashion in a way we can't even imagine today. Everyone, or at least everyone respectable, knew how to dance the waltz. And that knowledge has gotten somewhat lost nowadays. Mm, yes. But at least it is preserved, at least somewhat, in the schools of Mexico. That's neat. Yeah, and to some degree it's there in the quinceañeras, right? Mm. Because the waltz... Uh, the principal dance of the quinceañera, I, I believe, when they do the whole ritual of the girl becoming a woman, the dance with the chambelan or escort is a waltz. Yeah. Yeah, it hadn't occurred to me, but you're right. And it seems to me that everything about the quinceañeras is a bit in the old style, no? I mean, the dresses they wear, those are, those are right from the 19th century, just like the waltz. Yeah, yeah. It, it's very influenced by, well, European culture, right? L like Beauty and the Beast. It makes me think of Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but look, I, if I can share with you something I find interesting, because in the conversations I've had with my mom, or when my uncles get together and talk amongst themselves, I've heard them talk about how Pedro Infante, ranchera music, all that, all that music, for some, is the music of that generation. Well, in fact, it wasn't very popular with my grandparents. In mm -hmm. fact, my grandparents didn't like rancheras. When I asked my mom what kind of music my grandfather listened to, she said he really liked Argentinian music. He listened to the radio, and in those times there weren't many radio stations, mm -hmm. and probably even fewer when he was young. But my mom said he enjoyed music from Argentina, and that he felt that rancheras were a bit embarrassing, no? Uh -huh. At that time, well, my grandfather grew up during the time of the revolution in the early 1900s. It's so interesting what Abel tells us about his grandfather's musical tastes. I imagine that at that time in Tlachichila, Zacatecas, the town benefited from the RPM, Radio Programas de México, it was a federal initiative of 1941 that promoted the creation of various regional radio stations and supported them with programming and announcers. And as for the Argentine music that Abel's grandfather preferred, well, that could have been Atahualpa Yupanqui or another singer-songwriter from that great flourishing of Argentine song in the middle of the 20th century. Alberto Cortés, the Argentine singer-songwriter that Abel chose for his second song, was the next generation of that very tradition. And so the threads of taste and tradition braid themselves together across the decades. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, musical tastes have changed quite a bit, I think, and, and especially outside of the capital, right? A lot of ups and downs in enthusiasm for regional musics. It has to do with how pride is tied in with nationalism, or, or as you just said, that community pride, which is another thing entirely. And, well, it's, it's really interesting, really interesting. Yeah. Many times in these interviews, I, I find myself hearing memories of my interviewees' grandparents. And men, many of those people lived through the revolution. And the influence that time had on people's lives, even today, it's striking. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's had a great influence on life in the present day, and 
on music, of course. So, well, how cool. Okay, I think it's time to move on to your second song, which talks a bit about, well, your, your hopes, or as you put it, your aspirations for the future. And that song is Castillos en el Aire, or Castles in the Air, by Alberto Cortés. And I have to thank you for introducing me to this song because it it's really something. No sabe que volar es imposible, mas extendió las alas hacia el cielo y poco a poco fue ganando altura y los demás quedaron en el suelo guardando la cordura. Oh, what a great song. Okay. Joyful. Joyful. It's authentic joy, right? But it's funny, I think, because it actually talks about serious issues, but in a way that is so light. All right. How does this represent your hopes of it? No, like like you mentioned, I mean, the second question about what, re- what represents my hopes. Uh, well... So I grew up with urban rock, you know? Uh-huh. Not very hopeful stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's really, well, it's often very serious in tone and much of the time just speaking to the realities of urban life. But this song by Cortez, it's also talking about realities that we live, you know, as people. Like, I, I think it really connects me to the essence of being a child, no? We all grow up with the... I mean, the idea that the impossible doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah, it's that second part, that do-do-do-do, do <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have castles in the sky, right, Elizabeth? <laughs> yep, we should do. Yeah. So this song, I think it's great that Abel chose this song because in it, I think I'm able to see many, many layers of who he is. But before we get into that, maybe we should talk a little bit about what's going on musically and who the singer is. So the singer is Alberto Cortez, a very famous Argentinian singer who actually had his first major job singing for the Orquesta San Francisco Jazz. So I spent about an hour trying to make sure that this wasn't San Francisco, like my San Francisco. I'm from, I was born in Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area is my home. And I'm like, there's no way that he could be from there and I not know it. <laughs> yeah. Co- correct, he's not. There's the San Francisco jazz, the Buenos Aires. So there, ah. there it is, that's what it was. That, that's, that's what that was. Uh, he studied social sciences, but then transferred, or, or I should say, moved over to the music full time and then went on to become one of the most famous sought after uh, singer-songwriters in Latin America and I think we can see that quality and that caliber in this song there's a, a lot of familiarity with different types of music I heard a lot of familiarity with jazz uh, but I think most of all I love how this song is so dynamic and most <laughs> people might think that music from South America or music from Latin America in general is only one way it's either something like mariachi or something like salsa perhaps but in this song, we can see that you know, South American music and Latin American music is so dynamic. There's so much going on. It's so creative. Uh, it's so what I will call polycultural. Um, and I just really, really love that about this song. Yeah. It. Well, you know, dynamic it is, certainly is. I mean, it's kind of two songs jammed together. And, and it's interesting, you know, that you hear jazz in the influence because I, with my classical training, I hear classical music in that mm-hmm. opening, which is like kind of hyper dramatic it's it's a little bit operatic and i think he's making fun of the operatic trope mm-hmm. uh with this you know very dark beginning and then you know at, at a certain point there comes this and it's uh, you know and it's just every bit the opposite and they're in the same song which is of course the whole point of the message of the song uh the 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 conflict between uh adulthood and uh, and childhood that we all carry no matter what age we are are we all carry within us i came across a phrase when i was uh, researching cortes that i like a lot uh, that he was called the the singer songwriter of simple things beautiful I yeah 
Isn't that nice? Uh, and, and it really, I mean, this song is as simple as could be, and it's so effective. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it almost sounds like a children's song, right? Mm-hmm. It's quite notable. I was here like nodding my head and dancing a little bit because that's the sound. But but yeah, the the song, the lyrics, they talk about a real conflict but between, well, he calls it cordura, sanity, and love. And so is there such a conflict in your life? Do, do you ever find yourself wanting to fly and not being able to? How, how do you relate to the song? The song, like you say, talks about this conflict. I sort of see it as this adaptation that they call adulting. Mm. There are so many ideas, right, about what it is to be an adult. And often it means not idealizing the future anymore, right? And, I mean, I include myself among the among those who are doing projects that support, let's say, a different kind of future, right, in terms of community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for a lot of people, that's not realistic, right? It's something someone does when they're young in their rebellious phase, we could say. <laughs> Some of my uncles depict it like that. And and then the moment arrives when you have to get serious, figure out your life, get a secure job without many risks. And I think the way I relate to this song is that, well, we're creating like a cooperative or an alternative approach to food. Mm-hmm. And in one way, that makes me a dreamer. But on the other hand, I'm taking concrete steps, right? And well, on a personal level, I think in some ways I connect to that energy, you know, relating to people who have that essence, that want that essential connection with themselves and aren't so caught up in what the media shows us, right? What institutions are telling us about how we should think? You know, I'll tell you something. A few hours ago, I was doing a bit of research on Emma Goldman. And she was a Russian who emigrated to the United States in the early 20th century and became an anarchist. She was quite famous. And there's this quote that's attributed to her. You hear it all over the place. And it turns out she never said it. But that doesn't really matter. The quote is quite lovely. Mm -hmm. In, In Spanish, it would be, Si no puedo bailar, no quiero ser parte de tu revolución. Or in English, If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) And I think that it expresses very neatly something that this song by Cortés expresses too. The the importance of flying, the importance of spreading your wings. I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically, of course. It's real. It's profound. We have to dance. We have to be a bit frivolous sometimes, right? And the paradox is that it's actually quite important. It's really serious that that need to be joyful and frivolous from time to time yeah yeah i completely agree with you i i think for me my dance we could say is that is a day-to-day ability to grow crops you know on the farm no uh-huh. and and being able to do this practice farming for me well i don't see it as a job as work it's more like a way to clear my mind a, a way to center myself again I I imagine I'd like to think that every person has a way of connecting to that center of themselves and and many times like the song says well what an idiot <laughs> like <laughs> you can't do that because you have all these responsibilities or whatever it may be yeah that we all have enough faith in ourselves to be idiots every now and then right <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I really love the image of the the garden is a dance floor, so to speak. Exactly. You know, sometimes when I'm weeding in my own garden, I picture the whole garden as a party. And the, the so-called weeds, those are the uninvited guests. <laughs> it's another way of imagining it, I suppose. But yes, I, I believe that continuing to move forward, to have faith in life, it is like a dance, to return to that metaphor. It's, it's like a dance between the adult, as you say, and the frivolous or or, well, joy that can't be explained. The pure joy of being alive, right? But now I think we are approaching the end of our interview. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the Cortes song or about the themes that we've discussed in either of the songs? 
no, I think I'm satisfied there. I just very grateful to have been able to have this conversation with you. <laughs> Me too. It's been the highlight of my day. Oh, that's great. Yes, exactly. For me too. I, I'm very thankful because every story that comes out in these interviews is a treasure. Well, I agree. And it's that I don't know how much time we have or if it's part of the program, but I'd be interested to hear from you, well, a song from your origins and a song for your hopes. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. Uh, of course, yeah, I've thought about it a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <sighs> I, I'd say a song that really represents where I'm from would be, well, it's classical music. It's a piano concerto by Robert Schumann, who was a 19th century German composer, a little bit before Juventino Rosas. It's, it's beautiful, very romantic and passionate. <laughs> When I was 14 or 15 years old, I fell in love with this concerto. So for, for me, that's music that represents my origins, music that I loved and studied as an adolescent, and the music that I dedicated, well, it was my career for 20 years. And it's not my music anymore. And that is a painful thing for me. So there's a bit of conflict in that story, right? Mm. Yeah. I I find it interesting that you were interested in that musical genre from a young age. Oh, yes, passionately. I fell in love with that music, and I still love it. But I can't listen to it now, because it, it brings up several layers of painful, conflict-ridden memories. And because of that, I've taken a bit of distance from it. And okay, so briefly, uh, as for the future, well, I'll tell you that for me, the music that energizes me the most and fills me with hope, and this sounds strange, but it's the truth, it's my own music. From time to time, not, not very often, but from time to time, I write songs. Sometimes they're sones in the Haranera tradition, right? And sometimes they're more like folk music. But I do it purely in the spirit of play. It, it, it's that after so many years as a professional classical musician, during which music was like any other commodity to sell. Now I get to turn myself toward my own musics. I don't think my songs are particularly good, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they give me pleasure and relief and a very strong feeling of joy. So for me, those particular songs are my hope. Yeah. Uh, how cool. That's, that's awesome. And thank you for asking. That's a good question. <laughs> of course. Uh, thank you for sharing. And if someday you're willing to share it, I'd like to hear one of your songs. Well, I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'm thinking about it. I, I would like to record my songs. Okay. Well, then, Abel, I think it's time to say goodbye. And, and, well, I leave you with many thanks for sharing your perspective about life and music. It's a privilege to hear it. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And well, yeah, my heart is very happy to have had this opportunity. Thank you. And yeah, me too, me too. Many thanks. And you and your family take care. When is the due date, more or less? Uh, at the end of July. July 28th, supposedly, that's what the doctors think. Well, I'm very... Like the whole community, I'm very excited for you guys, and I, I wish you all the good things and joy during these moments. It's a very special time. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm personally super excited, and well, I can't wait to meet little Tlali. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, okay, have a great evening, a good weekend, and we'll be in touch. For sure, Elizabeth. Yes, thanks so much. Have a good day. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks, Abel. See you soon. See you soon. Ciao. 
We didn't play an example of the music that represents my hopes for the future because you're going to hear one very soon. The song with which we close every episode. Si yo fuera una canción. Well, it's by me. Meanwhile, we have put links to Crece, the community garden cooperative with which Avel works, on our website, si yo 